At the height of the Great Patriotic War, Dmitry Shostakovich wrote to his friend Isaac Glickman, a blizzard is raging outside the windows as 1944 approaches. It will be a year of happiness, of joy, of victory, a year that will bring us all much joy. The freedom-loving peoples will at last throw off the yoke of Hitlerism, peace will reign over the whole world, and we shall live once more in peace under the sun of Stalin's constitution. Of this I am convinced and consequently experience feelings of unalloyed joy. We know Shostakovich well enough by now not to take this utterance at face value. It is a good example of his penchant for talking through a mask of Soviet doublespeak so that a censor could read one thing and a friend another. The composer is echoing Stalin's own wearingly repetitive prose style, the threefold use of joy, Rodosti, is a typical Stalinist tick. Yet repetition is also a private code in this case. Glickman informs us in his edition of his correspondence with the composer that whenever Shostakovich repeats himself unnecessarily or emphasizes some distinctively stale phrase, he means the opposite of what he appears to be saying. Thus, when he writes, everything is so fine, so perfectly excellent that I can find almost nothing to write about. He's in fact saying that things are too awful to be described in correspondence that is being monitored by the secret police. Glickman says that Shostakovich used this code even in private conversation. I'm feeling fine meant that he was feeling awful. But did Shostakovich always mean the opposite of what he said? Did, in 1944, he take no joy at all in the prospect that freedom-loving peoples will at last throw off the yoke of Hitlerism? Currently popular conceptions of Shostakovich as ironist, as dissident, as chronicler of a tragic age have brought out complexities in his musical nature that were long neglected, but they ultimately limit his capacity to render the full range of human emotion, joy included. Even in the grip of totalitarian terror, life does go on, at least for most, in whatever damaged state. People are able to feel joy, fall in love, feel sorrow for personal reasons. Music is, in fact, better at communicating those primal emotions than it is at suggesting something as complicated as literary-style irony. Irony in this standard definition is saying the opposite of what one appears to be saying. For us to talk about musical irony, we first have to agree on what the music appears to be saying. Then we have to agree on what the music is actually saying. This is devilishly difficult to do. What we can do when we speak about Shostakovich's irony is to cast a degree of doubt on any interpretation that displays too much certitude about what the music really means. These are the things I want to keep in mind as I talk about the Leningrad Symphony, which Shostakovich wrote in 1941 in the wake of the German invasion of the Soviet Union, which is not to say that I won't be offering my own interpretation, but it is offered in the spirit of opening up alternative possibilities of hearing not closing down possibilities that have already been set forth. There is no question of Shostakovich's devotion to the war effort. When Germany invaded Russia, the composer went to the headquarters of the Leningrad Civil Defense with his pupil, Venyamin Fleischmann, and volunteered for duty. When he was turned away on account of his poor eyesight, he joined the Leningrad Conservatory Fire Brigade and moved into a barrack in the building. A famous photo shows him tricked out in his fireman's helmet on the conservatory roof. It later turned out that this image was staged for propaganda purposes, and Shostakovich's colleagues made sure to keep him out of harm's way. On July 19th, he set to work on the Seventh Symphony, which he intended to call the Leningrad. Obsessed by his task, he sometimes brought the score with him to the conservatory roof. On September 1st, he announced on the radio that he had finished the first part of the work. Our art is threatened with great danger, he said. We will defend our music. This speech was remembered by many in Leningrad, not only musicians, but citizens at large, as a defining moment in the history of the siege. A few days later, German artillery shells began landing on the city. Shostakovich played what he had written for several composer friends and continued playing even as the air raid sirens went off and anti-aircraft anti fire all but drowned him out. According to one account, Shostakovich was wont to quote the Russian proverb, when the guns speak, the muses are silent, and then added, here the, music's, the muses speak together with the guns. On October 1st, he was evacuated from the city, not of his own volition, but on the orders of the government. 
The Leningrad had its premiere in March 1941 in Kubyshev, formerly Samara, a city in the Volga region where Shostakovich had sought refuge during the winter. It then began to make its way around the world, its progress complicated by wartime. A talk of the town item in the New Yorker magazine chronicled how the score got to New York in terms uh, suitable for a B-grade movie. It was transferred to microfilm, put in a tin can, flown to Tehran, driven by car to Cairo, and finally flown to London and on to New York. Toscanini conducted the Western premiere on NBC radio on July 19, 1942, exactly one year after Shostakovich had begun writing the piece. Time magazine famously commemorated the occasion by putting Shostakovich on its cover in full firefighting regalia. Amid bombs bursting in Leningrad, he heard the chords of victory, read the cover line. A huge national audience listened to Toscanini's broadcast. Shostakovich became a propaganda symbol for the entire Allied cause, a profile in courage. As Christopher Gibbs has detailed in an article that appeared in the anthology Shostakovich and His World, 12 different American orchestras gave a total of 46 performances of the work in the six months after the Toscanini premiere, capitalizing on the extraordinary circumstances of its composition, premiere, and journey to the United States, together with its symbolic connection to the war effort. The promotion of the Leningrad in the American media led, inevitably, to an intellectual backlash. The composer critic Virgil Thompson in the New York Herald Tribune fired off the opening shots, calling the work thin of substance, unoriginal, and shallow, uh, which were the uh, most lethal, uh, the, it was the most lethal trio of adjectives that Thompson had aimed at a composition since he called the Sibelius Second Symphony vulgar, self-indulgent, and provincial beyond all description. Uh, <laughs> And he added that Shostakovich is willing to write down to a real or fictitious psychology of mass consumption, he'd been uh, exchanging letters with Theodore Dorno in this period, in a way that may eventually disqualify him for consideration as a serious composer. We need not concern ourselves too much here with this obvious instance of a familiar syndrome in the elite reception of art in the modern media age, whereby any art, any artist who happens to achieve broad popularity is automatically dismissed as something less than serious. Suffice to say that we are gathered here now for a Shostakovich festival, not a Virgil Thompson festival. <laughs> okay. He asked for it. As Gibbs demonstrates in his article, Performances of the Leningrad declined rapidly in the post-war era, apparently as a result of the changed political landscape of the Cold War era, but also, of course, uh, as the intellectual, intellectual backlash against Shostakovich continued. Between 1945 and 1984, there were only three performances by the so-called Big Five American orchestras, two under Leonard Bernstein's direction and one under Yuri Temerkhanov. Since then, performances have picked up considerably, and the symphony has become one of the composer's most popular works. This revival was almost certainly related in part to the publication of the so-called Shostakovich, Shostakovich memoirs, Solomon Volkov's testimony, which presented Shostakovich not as a Soviet stooge, but as a dissident, and the Leningrad not as musical propaganda, but as a secret protest against Stalinist oppression. The whole Volkov business is not something I'm going to get into here. Back in the Soviet Union, the meaning of the Leningrad was always simpler. It was tied up in the incredible, incredibly powerful emotions that surrounded the drawn-out siege of Leningrad. The most famous performance took place in Leningrad itself on August 9th, 1942, 33 years to the day before Shostakovich's own death, in the middle of the 900-day siege. The score was flown by military aircraft in June, flown in by military aircraft in June, and a severely depleted Leningrad radio orchestra under the direction of Karl Eliasberg set to work learning it. After a mere 15 musicians showed up for the initial rehearsal, General Govorov ordered all competent musicians to report from the front lines. The players would break from rehearsals to return to their duties, which in one case included the digging of mass graves for victims of the siege. Three members of the orchestra died of starvation before the premiere took place. The commanding German general heard about the performance in advance and planned to disrupt it, but the Soviets preempted him by launching an unprecedented bombardment of German positions, Operation Squall, it was called. An array of loudspeakers then broadcast the Leningrad Symphony into the silence of no man's land. 
One group of German soldiers visiting Leningrad long after the war supposedly told Eliasberg that when they heard Shostakovich's music rising from the other side of the barricades, they realized that they would never take Leningrad. This was Shostakovich's music weaponized, turned into a, into a devastating instrument of psychological warfare aimed at the enemy. No performance quite like it had ever happened in musical history, and presumably none like it will happen again. On to the music itself. After Shostakovich left Leningrad, he wrote up a detailed program for the first three movements of the symphony, which was later printed in the American communist journal New Masses. It is naturally a studiously bland document, although there might be the barest hint of a clue hidden in it. The exposition of the first movement tells of the happy, peaceful life of people sure of themselves and their future, Shostakovich writes. This is the simple, peaceful life lived before the war. In the development, war bursts into the peaceful life of these people. I am not aiming for the naturalistic depiction of war, the depiction of the clatter of arms, the explosion of shells, and so on. I am trying to convey the image of war emotionally. The word peaceful appears three times, which would seem to trigger Isaac Glickman's decoding device and signal the possible presence of irony. We get a hint that the dichotomy between peace and war in the Soviet Union of 1941 might not be as clear as it would appear to an outsider. How well does Shostakovich's description match up with the music? The symphony does indeed begin in something like an idyllic, peaceful atmosphere, first with a robust theme in C major and then with lyrical contrasting material in G major, in sync with the tonic dominant relationship of classical sonata form. Toward the end of the exposition, however, the luminosity of the scene fades a little. A languid piccolo melody, sounding very much like someone whistling in the fields, looks for a space in which to stretch out and relax. But the phrase trails off into space with extraneous tones dangling like errant threns, threads at the end of a frayed piece of string. The music keeps drifting toward the foreign key of E flat. A wistful solo violin muses over that frayed motif at the very end of the section, looking for a way back to C. It plays over an indecisive chord, which on close inspection turns out to be the first four notes of the symphony combined and transposed. The chord dies away, morendo. In all, the symphony's vigorous beginning gives way to an atmosphere of uncertainty, perhaps even fear. The invasion episode, as Shostakovich himself called it in a 1951 article, is a very odd depiction of Hitler's Operation Barbarossa, if that is what it is. It begins as a picaresque procession, a Pied Piper march. It ends as a savage, stupid rant. In one of the variations, the accompanying pattern sounds very much like a child's chant of nya nya. The theme of the episode does not sound particularly German. True, it quotes an operetta melody by Franz Lehár, Da Geich zu Maxim, from The Merry Widow, uh, and Lehár was known to be one of Hitler's favorite composers. But the march itself is in bolero rhythm, and the variation structure is modeled on Ravel's work of the same name. Operetta by a Hungarian of Vienna, a Spanish dance modified by a Frenchman, this blitzkrieg is a sort of European mishmash. And the midsection of the theme uh, its falling scalar pattern echoes a bit of the innocent tune whistled by the piccolo in, th in the introduction. This is underlined by the fact that the piccolo is one of the first instruments to play uh, one of the many repetitions of the theme. In other words, the them thematic material of the opening movement depicting supposedly the people at rest and the thematic material of the invasion episode depicting even more supposedly Nazi troops on the march seem derived from the same source. Notice that the bolero material also returns at the very end of the movement at low volume, suggesting that the whole process is about to begin again. At the very end of the symphony, during the scene of ostensible final victory, with the people's theme blaring grandly and thrillingly in the trombones, we find, curiously, just a hint of the invasion theme returning, incorporated into this brilliant, overbearing, slightly frightening conclusion. The timpani bang out the notes A, uh, excuse me, G, A flat, G, B flat, G, E flat, G, suggesting a contrary tonality of E flat against the prevailing C. E flat is the key in which the bolero or invasion sequence unfolded. And here is something I have to believe is a hidden Shostakovich joke. 
the snare drum taps out a figure that is not unlike the snare drum figure that drives the invasion sequence. But now, with quadruplets converted into triplets, it is actually more like Ravel's bolero than before. It's curious, by the way, that this martial conclusion slips for two bars into three, four time, and then into one bar of five, four, before resuming the march-like four, four. The triumphant Soviet armies, if that is what we are hearing, are made to do the bolero for a moment, and also a lopsided waltz. The possibility arises that this music depicts something more or something other than the German invasion. Shostakovich apparently suggested as much in conversation with friends. Someone had identified the bolero theme with fascism. Of course, fascism, he said, according to Flora Litvinova. But music, real music, can never be literally tied to a theme. National socialism is not the only form of fascism. This music is about all forms of terror, slavery, the bondage of the spirit. Shostakovich is prompting us to think about the Leningrad in different ways. The experience of the Soviet people under Stalin, doubtless included, Though it should be emphasized, he is not proposing a new alternative interpretation of the work. Indeed, he is again arguing against the idea of a single dominant interpretation. Three other contemporary commentaries cast an interesting light on Shostakovich's intentions, or at least on the imaginative world out of which the symphony came, the cultural context. One came from the composer Arthur Laurier, who had been the music commissar in the Soviet Union for three years uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution before fleeing to the West. In 1943, Laurier wrote an article for a New York Russian journal uh, in which he said that the big tune in the first movement of the Leningrad struck him as being an ironic mask. It reminded him of an insouciant character in a Zoschenko story, whistling as he goes, and the slow ratcheting up of tension and alarm around this melody put him in mind of the march to the scaffold in Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique. He speculated that the symphony was a vast panorama of Russian suffering and struggle, both before and after Hitler's invasion. The second surprising reaction, and even more interesting in my mind, came from the great film director Sergei Eisenstein. In his memoirs, Eisenstein said that the invasion sequence of the Leningrad reminded him of a scene in Dostoevsky's The Demons, or The Possessed, that monumentally spiteful satire of 19th century Russian progressives, revolutionaries, anarchists, and other leftist agitators, which, needless to say, was not a uh, popularly approved work during the Stalin time. The scene to which Eisenstein refers involves Lyamshin, a minor member of the circle of conspirators that form the center of Dostoevsky's novel. He is a post office clerk, a part-time pianist and composer, and an all-around prankster and scoundrel who seems more interested in creating provocations than launching revolutions. Eventually, it is he who exposes his colleagues to the police. Earlier in the novel, he entertains his friends with a piano piece entitled The Franco-Prussian War. Dostoevsky describes it thus. It began with the menacing strains of the Marseillaise, Cansang Ampur Abreuve Notion. A flamboyant challenge was heard, the flush of future victories, but suddenly mingling with the mastery vari masterly variations on the national anthem. Somewhere, on one side, from below, from some corner, but very close, came the trivial strains of Mein Lieber Augustin, Ach, Mein Lieber Augustin. Da, 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 dum, bum, 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 bum. The Marseillaise ignored them. The Marseillaise reached the climax of intoxication with its own grandeur, but Augustin was gaining strength. It was getting more and more insolent, and suddenly the strains of Augustin began to blend with the strains of the Marseillaise. The latter was apparently getting angry, unable to ignore Augustin any longer. It tried to shake it off, to brush it off, like some obtrusive, insignificant fly, but Mein Lieber Augustin was hanging on firmly. He was gay and self confident, he was full of joy and arrogance, and the Marseillaise suddenly somehow became terribly stupid. It could no longer conceal its resentment and exasperation. It was a wail of indignation, tears and oaths, with arms outstretched to providence. Uh, uh, I'm going to skip the French. But already it was forced to sing in tune, in time, with Mein Lieber Augustin. Its melody passed in a most stupid way into that of the Augustin. It drooped and died. Only from time to time could a, a snatch of the original tune be heard, consang and pur. But immediately they passed most mortifyingly into the horrible waltz. Suddenly it was utterly subdued. It was Jules Favre sobbing on Bismarck's bosom and giving away everything, everything. 
This is a sort of forecast of Liamshin's own confession at the end of the novel. But now it was Augustine's turn to assert himself. Hoarse sounds were heard. One had a feeling of countless barrels of beer, the frenzy of self-glorification, demands for milliards, expensive cigars, champagne, and hostages. Augustine passed into a wild roar. The Franco-Prussian War was at an end. Our young people applauded. Mrs. Lemke smiled and said, well, how can one turn him out? Peace was made. The blackguard really had a sort of talent. Mr. Vekovjensky assured me one day that men of the highest artistic talent could be the most awful blackguards and that one thing had nothing to do with the other. It's an allusion, as many of you know, to the, the line in Pushkin's Mozart and Salieri. Uh, Eisenstein remarks, surely it is this page of the great Russian writer's work that lies at the heart of the Leningrad Symphony. It is a plausible association. First, Shostakovich is known to have been fascinated by the demons. He named it close to the top of a list of literary works that influenced him in a questionnaire he answered in 1927 and 1928. Interestingly, the following year, he wrote music for the film The New Babylon, which takes the period of the Franco-Prussian War and the Paris Commune as its subject, and the score engages in shenanigans similar to the ones described in the Dostoevsky passage, including sardonic manipulations of the Marseillaise. At the end of his life, Shostakovich seemed to become obsessed by Dostoevsky's The Demons once again, if indeed he ever stopped thinking about it, and in the summer of 1974, he set the verses of Captain Lebyadkin from the novel. He had a history of identifying himself with hysterical, self-abusing Dostoevsky characters, and it is not out of the question that he should have seen himself to some extent in the real role of Liamshin. The last observer I want to bring into the case is Anna Akhmatova. The great poet left Leningrad at around the same time Shostakovich did, carrying, it is said, a second manuscript of the Seventh Symphony, the Leningrad, in her arms. She made reference to the event at the end of the original version of her epic poem, Poem Without a Hero. According to Roberta Reeder, editor of the Akhmatova Complete Poems, the following lines are meant to evoke Volkakov's great novel, The Master and Margarita, then unpublished but much read among the Soviet intelligentsia. I can't hope to summarize the fantastical plot of Master and Margarita briefly here. Suffice to say that Akhmatova is apparently alluding to a scene in which the character of Margarita discovers that she has gained witch-like powers and flies on her broomstick to Satan's feast on Walpurgisnacht. The manuscript of the Seventh Symphony, it appears, is sort of the broomstick on which Akhmatova rides as she flies from Leningrad. And after me, sparkling with a mystery, and having named herself the seventh, she rushed to an unprecedented feast. Pretending to be a musical score, the famous Leningrader returned to her native ether. These phrases, sparkling with a mystery and unprecedented feast, are surprising ones to encounter in the vicinity of the Leningrad, which is so often heard as a dismal military affair full of the noise and suffering of war. What if, here's my radical suggestion for the afternoon, we don't necessarily need to think of the invasion sequence as a negative event. We've always taken it for granted that the first section of the movement represents something good and the invasion something evil. This duality has been preserved even when the identity of the evil in question has shifted from Hitler to Stalin. But it's possible that Shostakovich was being truly deeply ironic when he wrote his description and had turned the entire hierarchy upside down. It's possible that the invasion is actually a kind of musical Walpurgisnacht that joyously overturns a tedious official world. I'm surely not the only one who actually looks forward to the beginning of the invasion sequence while the first few minutes of the symphony are unfolding. Fine and noble as the opening is, the work really gets going when that soft snare drum steals in. Everything preceding it has been an elaborate setup. The same, incidentally, applies for me to Richard Strauss's Heldenleben, which only becomes interesting when the self-consciously heroic music of the opening section screeches to a halt and the quasi-atonal twittering of the critics takes over, although maybe that's just an autobiographical association on my part. <laughs> Part of the perverse pleasure of the sequence, the invasion sequence in the Leningrad, is that it takes the form of an extended demolition of the approved practices of sonata form, whereby the presentation of first and second themes gives way to a clear, systematic development of that material. 
instead of a development, seemingly, here is this immense bolero march, this feast of repetition and manic variation, deliberately vulgar and brutal and clownish. It's as if the symphony is literally being invaded by another kind of work entirely. No wonder schoolmasterish critics such as Virgil Thompson were consternated by it. And no wonder the likes of Akhmatova and Eisenstein were carried away by it, comparing it to fantastic scenes, disruptive scenes, polyphonic scenes in Russian novels. And actually, uh, and here's the real trick that Shostakovich plays, the material of this theme is in fact directly derived, uh, although rather clandestinely so, from the first and second themes of the symphony as they have been presented. I already noted the resemblance of that falling scalar figure uh, to the, the uh, second melody, particularly as played by the piccolo. Uh, I think you can uh, also derive the opening notes of the theme from the very opening notes of the symphony. Uh, they both involve the first, second, and fifth degrees of the diatonic major scale. It's telling that Shostakovich went back to this allegedly Hitlerite or Stalinist march theme in his final symphony, the 15th. There, chromatically distorted, it becomes the Pasakalia theme of the final movement. It is last heard quietly on the timpani, the instrument on which so many crucial announcements in Shostakovich's music are made, beneath a skeletonic dance that recalls two other masterpieces of Shostakovich's youth, the opera The Nose and the Fourth Symphony, both, of course, repressed or not played for many decades. You may hear this recollection of the Leningrad as a memory of all the evil that had gone before, still creeping through the world, though now it's softer volume. But I think that Shostakovich would not have recycled this music unless he felt some special connection to it, even some special fondness for it. Because composers tend not to write down music that they do not in some way love. We as listeners tend to weaponize music, make it a tool of our own ideas and feelings. Composers don't think that way. They're trying to coax into existence an organic thing so that it will take root and grow, and interpretations of the diagrammatic kind tend to suck away the air around their creations. In Bulgakov's The Master and Margarita, the devil is not such a bad fellow. He and his anarchic surrealist retinue are something other than agents of the state. They seem to be exposing the madness of Stalin's society by way of violent farce and end up liberating the master from the asylum in which he has been confined. When a society is saturated in evil, Bulgakov suggests, criminals, madmen, witches, and devils become the pillars of society. He heads his novel with the words of Mephistopheles and Faust, I am part of that power which eternally wills evil and eternally works good. The devil, in other words, is always an ironist, doing the opposite of what he says. We, we may never be sure of what such a devil is really saying, but the primary, his primary work is in exposing, stripping, and corroding the shiny surfaces of normal life. He is a double dealer with divided soul, as the poet Osip Mandelstam described himself. He is an honest devil in an evil heaven. There is more than a little bit of him in Dmitry Shostakovich. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is a, the sort of the tasks that's uh, standing in front of uh, people who write about Shostakovich and, and think about Shostakovich uh, uh, right now as having uh, thrashed all of this material out uh, for so long. Uh, it is uh, time to, to talk about the music, certainly uh, on its own terms, uh, more than before. I, I actually had a, a fantasy when I last read about Shostakovich in The New Yorker that, that I was going to uh, uh, write the entire column without mentioning Stalin, <laughs> uh, which would perhaps be the, the, the uh, greatest tribute uh, you could make um, uh, to what he went through. Uh, uh, didn't didn't uh, get get away with it at that time, but uh, uh, it 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 is it is the, the the major project, you know. And yet at the same time, there's still much to be discovered, and people are still going through the archives of the. Uh, uh, the, the cultural uh, establishment in, in the Soviet Union during this period and, and, and making some remarkable discoveries. Uh, so I think for, for historians, there's uh, still much more to be found, and, and, and musicologists and, and critics and listeners will want to keep track of all that. Uh, but it, it certainly is uh, very refreshing when, when you have uh, Shostakovich uh, 
uh, and, and I think the performance, you're right, the performances last night, uh, I, was, I was particularly struck by uh, Valery Gergiev's uh, conducting of the, uh, the coda of the symphony overall, which is uh, very often talked about as an episode of, of absolutely sort of uh, hysterical, uh, kind of a sort of hysterical outburst on Shostakovich's uh, part linked uh, to a famous uh, anecdote about uh, him uh, yelling his, his own name over and over again. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the way Gergiev did it, he, 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 he really uh, made, a, sort of made it into an episode of, of uh, relatively straightforward, though perhaps not entirely unblemished, uh, uh, joy or triumph. And I've always felt that that music is very much inflected by uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, uh, these kind of upward rushing and downward rushing uh, figures in the strings. It, it, it really looks very much like a uh, Shostakovich uh, coda or finale in places. And I think that was really the, the quality uh, that, uh, that uh, Gergiev brought out, kind of the triumph of, of uh, Russian classicism, uh, perhaps, uh, over uh, everything that had, that had gone before. Um, but this is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely what we sort of need to do next with, with Shostakovich. You're right. That symphony fell out of favor in America in the 50s, is that correct? Sorry? You said that the 50s fell out of favor. Yeah. When did American history start playing it again? Yeah, well, as I, as I quoted the statistics, there were, um, there were only three performances between uh, 1945 and, uh, or maybe 1948 or so, and uh, 1984 among the, 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 the big, so called Big Five orchestras, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Cleveland, Chicago, and Boston. Uh, and, uh, and then it really very, very suddenly it picks up uh, in, in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, certain conductors uh, took it up and were playing it very regularly, uh, Kurt Mazur and uh, Yuri Termakhanov. Uh, and uh, a number of conductors sort of simultaneously began to, to push for this symphony to be taken seriously once again. So it's the, the 1980s and, and 1990s. And now in, in New York, I think we have a, a performance at, at least once uh, a season, uh, actually uh, twice uh, in the current season in New York. So it's become uh, one of Shostakovich's most popular symphonies. Uh, and uh, I think this really has to do with, for so long, it was just uh, seen as such a kind of an artifact uh, of its time, uh, almost a sort of a quaint artifact of, of, of the war period. and, and uh, not Shostakovich's best music because because it was written for for such obvious uh, 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 programmatic with such obvious programmatic intent uh, or or so it seemed uh, and uh, I think now people are, are more and more inclined to uh, to see it I, I feel that that it really is a, <clears throat> a major work if if not without its occasional longers uh, and it deserves to be taken very seriously again. Of, uh, of paradox and irony in the, in the musical structure itself. And I'm wondering if that isn't uh, some kind of more abstract, generalized statement about life that then includes some of these tremendous ironies of political history in the Soviet Union at the time. That there isn't some kind of intermediate position between uh, viewing, viewing music as not having anything to do with it politics and viewing it as being an absolute expression of politics. Oh, absolutely. No, I very much agree with that. I think that was really what I was trying to, to drive at in, in a way with all of this is a sense that, uh, um, that I mean, I just find it so interesting that uh, listeners such as uh, Eisenstein and Akhmatova would have, would have made these uh, associations to, to the, the Russian uh, literary tradition uh, in listening to this music, uh, and that it, it's, it's as if we're sort of seeing a, a primal scene uh, played out in, 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 the, in the contemporary period, in the, in the context of the piece, with, with all its political particulars. Uh, but there's, there's a, a, a deeper tale at work here, which is really just um, the, the artist within society, uh, the sort of uh, the, the, the independent 
an, an unruly and ungovernable uh, artist within within a, a conventional society, within bourgeois society, or, or whatever whatever sort of version of that of that uh, tale you, you you want to tell, depending on the period. Uh, and, and so uh, this is this is the dynamic that that is that, that is uh, getting played out, and and, and the artist who makes some concessions uh, to to make his career within society, but then. Uh, uh, preserves this kind of uh, uh, anarchic, independent uh, streak within himself that, that erupts to the surface. Uh, so yeah, it's, it is a, it's a very good compromise to sort of combine those two things together. And you know, what I always think about is uh, sort of a thought experiment. What if Shostakovich had, had emigrated, difficult as it is to um, imagine in, in you know, 19... Uh, 21, uh, well, no, he was much too young, in, in 1927 uh, or, or, or 1930 or, or, or at some point, and ended up, you know, living in, in New Jersey and, and writing, you know, huge symphonies that might have been about the, the sheer difficulty of living in New Jersey. And, and you know, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the point is that Shostakovich had a stylistic imprint, uh, which was uh, so apparent very early on in his career. Uh, and, uh, you know, the first symphony, uh, you already feel this. Uh, um, if not all of his sort of harmonic, characteristic harmonic tricks in place, certainly um, his narrative control and his, and his amazing way of sort of laying out some relatively simple uh, materials in front of you and, and navigating among them in a way that, that, that creates tension uh, and that uh, the, the, the bottom dropping suddenly out of the music and, and a sort of a solitary figure sort of proceeding across the landscape and all these very, very characteristic uh, uh, sort of Shostakovichian uh, uh, materials in that piece, uh, and this was by you know a conservatory student who who you know had, had you know, yet to to confront the the the, the realities and, and difficulties of the period, and and uh, uh, it, it was in fact uh, you know b before uh, the, the 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 true awfulness of the nature of the regime had had manifested itself. Uh, so it, it's it's you know I think Shostakovich was was in a way a uh, uh, just a, a, a composer of incredible uh, dramatic skill who who uh, happened to live through a, a time of of unbelievable drama uh, and and the two uh, you know seem to uh, reflect each other but he might have written much the same music uh, in in completely different circumstances and that's a kind of fascinating mystery to contemplate intellectuals and artists in the Soviet Union who were either emigrated or remained uh, uh, dissidents. How did they regard uh, Shostakovich, the Sakharovs, the you Akhmetovas, know, the Stravinskys? Did they regard him as being uh, complicit or did they regard him as being uh, uh, one of them as far as he could be one of them? Mm, usually not. <laughs> but uh, there, I think there, there are variations. Uh, among among the uh, uh, attitudes of the of the emigres slash dissidents, uh, I mean, I, I think I'm certainly not an expert in Akhmatova. I, I I believe that uh, her her opinion of Shostakovich remained um, warm to to the point of being worshipful or at least very respectful for for uh, most of her life. I, I assume um, Stravinsky, of course, had had uh, great contempt for, for Shostakovich, probably not unmixed with envy, and I think there are issues there that, that don't have much to do with the, uh, the situation in the Soviet Union, but simply the, the fact that Shostakovich became uh, so popular uh, for a period of time that Stravinsky inevitably became uh, resentful. Uh, but of course, there was also a, a political element <clears throat> to that, and uh, Nicholas Nabokov uh, campaigned against Shostakovich in, in American <laughs> magazines in, in the uh, after the, the period of the, the Leningrad's uh, greatest popularity. Um, Sakharov, I mean, it, I think particularly toward the, toward the end of Shostakovich's life, uh, there were more and more, there were younger uh, people in uh, the Soviet Union, whether uh, dissidents or, or simply younger people who were just less inclined to, to play along with the, the system as it was, uh, who were really very distressed uh, and uh, uh, were angered by uh, some of Shostakovich's uh, seemingly more unnecessary gestures uh, of playing along with the system, uh, joining the Communist Party uh, in 1960. And uh, there was an infamous incident where his signature ended up 
uh, on a uh, the the letter denouncing uh, Sakharov in, in 1973, I think it was, and um, I think I have this in my notes somewhere. Actually, um, uh, yeah, uh, Lydia Chukovskaya. I apologize for murdering the Russian language, by the way. Um, wrote uh, an open letter uh, denouncing uh, this, the, the fact that Shostakovich had signed this letter. Uh, and in it, she quoted this line of Pushkin from, from Mozart and Salieri, which I, I mentioned uh, briefly, which is, which is also alluded to in uh, uh, the Dostoevsky passage I read. Uh, the, um, uh, just, just before Mozart, uh, it's, a, it's a Pushkin's play about uh, supposedly Salieri poisoning Mozart. And just before he takes his fatal sip of wine, Mozart says, genius and villainy don't go together, do they? Um, and um, Chukovskaya uh, quoted this line and said, in Shostakovich's case, those words had ceased to be true. Uh, and uh, so this was a, a very uh, damning statement. And, and you know, given Shostakovich's love for, for precisely these uh, Russian literary sources, if he, if he saw that letter, and he probably did, it must have uh, uh, really uh, been, been a, a sharp blow indeed. And uh, you know, at, the, at the end of his life, there, there's various accounts of, of him in these sort of self-flagellating uh, moods, uh, bemoaning how, how he can never say no, and, 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 and he always gives in, uh, and, uh, which, is, which is why I, I made the, uh, the association with the character of of Liamshin, who, who at the end of the the uh, the demons uh, uh, gives him up to the, himself up to the the police and, and confesses in, in the most abject manner. Um, but uh, but there's much to be said about the you know the complexity of, of Shostakovich's situation all through his life and and, and uh, you know it's uh, uh, I think the, the the passions that people felt at, at that moment in 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 the in the early 70s I think many of them. Uh, uh, if they're still around, would be inclined to, to look back and, and see things somewhat differently, and, and just uh, uh, just the, the, the sheer quantity of what Shostakovich had been through. You know, it's just difficult to imagine what you know how, how uh, any of us would have uh, acted much more uh, nobly uh, in, in, in these circumstances. Uh, but but there, there there certainly was. I mean, you can't escape the fact that there's an aspect of, of Shostakovich toward the end of his life where he uh, uh, he, he really uh, caved in uh, to to a degree that's distressing to, to read in the biography now. What, um... Go ahead. For uh, uh, I wonder what your view is about how performers and interpreters should navigate this complicated landscape between the political and the music itself. Um, you've heard a lot of Shostakovich performances, and I wonder for you makes for the most satisfying ones, and if there's any, any draw from that. Right. Well, I mean, there has been a tendency, I felt, in performances, Shostakovich performances I've heard over the last 10 years or more, which I think of as kind of the Brucknerization of Shostakovich, uh, where it seems that every performance you hear is just a little bit longer, a little bit slower, a little bit more desolate and dismal and somber and morbid in atmosphere, uh, to the point where, where some of the, the life is, is really being uh, sucked out of the music. Uh, uh, I would not say that at all about um, the, the Gergiev performances uh, that we heard last night, which uh, is particularly the Tenth Symphony. I just thought there was something very refreshing uh, about the way that that, uh, that he did not take the the, the first movement at a, at a in, incredibly uh, slow tempo, and 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 there was a kind of a, a brightness in in the playing of the the finale, which uh, has tended to to disappear ever since people have read those those uh, anecdotes about. Uh, Shostakovich picturing himself as a you know, puppet on a string and, and, and a series of anecdotes which uh, have been connected to that piece. Um, so, I mean, I think right now, it, it, and this, is, it, I, this actually doesn't have um, much to do with uh, uh, Shostakovich, maybe, but just with the, the tendency of, of some conductors just to, to play everything you know, slower and slower and, and sort of with more and more uh, kind of overbearing grandiosity, uh, and, and this has affected Mahler performances too, uh, I feel. So I, I really welcome uh, performances that, that emphasize wit uh, and uh, uh, sort of uh, all kinds of 
uh, sort of intermediate emotional nuances. I mean, I think this composer, there just uh, there's so many shades between um, the joyful and the tragic. I mean, he's just a master at creating these these ambiguous, ambivalent moods. Where you know, is this wistful? Is this uh, nostalgic? Is it fearful? Is it you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a certain quality of moderato sort of mezzo forte music that that, that, that he writes, uh, which is just fascinating to, to, to try to tease out the the emotional substance of it. Um, and uh, so I think that's that's really where I'd, I'd like to see us go. And I, I mean, in, the, in this my little talk, I was I was trying to emphasize some of these qualities of sort of uh, uh, wit uh, and irony, uh, not in the sense of of uh, of, of sort of um, undermining the banality of Soviet official pronouncements, but but this uh, this uh, this deeper, older kind of Russian literary irony, which is which is all over his music, uh, and uh, you know the the. Uh, the color and the variety, and, and his sly references to 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 you know music of uh, of so many different periods, um, and uh, you know I, you know Ian Shostakovich and then every other composer, I feel you know we 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 need we need to have more performances like that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, we were in the Imperial Symphony trying to bring in a point that the period of Shostakovich's life spans a broad period. Uh, which complexities have to be understood and not all at one time. Do you think perhaps you know, many assessments of trust of in the United States and those are being made now fall into a sort of Cold War, a neo-Cold War paradigm? How could trust of uh, possibly be uh, a defender of the Soviet Union? Isn't it also possible to understand trust of in his music as uh, a protest and uh, expressing the horror of the destruction of the socialist and democratic intelligentsia against what was, I think, essentially a right wing regime. Mm -hmm. Does not perhaps offer an alternative approach, one which doesn't place Shostakovich as, uh, you know, understands the real contradictions in which that man lived as a man whose ideals expressed by the use of the 20s were betrayed uh, by what occurred in the 1930s, where many of his colleagues and friends and intellectuals. Artistic uh, co-thinkers were destroyed. Yeah, I think I mean for a number of years now we've we've had a a, a, a passionate articulation uh, out there uh, first in the in the Volkov book and, and then in uh, uh, Ian McDonald's book on on Shostakovich and then a host of other uh, writers and uh, musicologists as well uh, who have been uh, pointing out um, uh, suggesting readings of Shostakovich's symphonies uh, emphasizing their subversive tendencies, their, their dissident tendencies, uh, their um, way of, of sort of presenting a, an official facade and then uh, uh, suggesting the, the, the wreckage uh, and, and the, the suffering around that facade. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's become a, a, a familiar take on Shostakovich, and I think it's done a great service, uh, first of all, in reviving interest in, in this composer, and, and you really can uh, track the, the renaissance of uh, uh, problems of the Leningrad Symphony. I mean, I just think it's no accident that, that, that they all suddenly sprout up uh, in the 1980s, immediately after the, the uh, publication of the Volkov book, uh, and uh, impelling um, performers uh, and listeners uh, to uh, look at this music and listen to this music in a different way. And, and I think it, it, it has done an important service that way. Um, but ultimately, I, I do think that, that it, it has tended to, to uh, it, it carry too far. It, it becomes a limiting perspective, almost as limiting as the old um, official point of view. Uh, on Shostakovich, and it just it sort of locks him in this uh, endless uh, uh, political discussion. You know, is he? I just is absolutely so tired of the question. You know, is, is he a, a official? You know, voice of, of Soviet propaganda, or is he a, a, a tireless, brave, courageous dissident who, in every bar of his music, is protesting against the system? You know, it's just a ridiculously uh, simplistic way of looking at such a, a, a complex and ambiguous artist. Uh, so you know, obviously, we need we need an interpretation which is uh, somewhere in the middle of of those two extremes, and we we may well really evolve it by taking some time off from the uh, from the political question for a while, and uh, uh, either simply looking at the music on its own terms uh, or looking at it in in a, in a broader 
uh, context, uh, a Russian uh, cultural and literary context, uh, and not just within within the political one. But I think all of these, I mean, uh, you know, everyone sort of finds their own way into this music, uh, and uh, so the, you know, all of these um, perspectives have their have their value and have done their work. And the music uh, will inevitably elude them all. The music doesn't care. You know, the music is is uh, off off on its own. Uh, and uh, this is this is a composer who is clearly with us for uh, the long term, uh, and uh, the perspectives on him will, will continue to uh, evolve over time. Um, but it's it's actually simply exciting to to watch this happening, to watch a composer sort of proceeding grandly into the into the, the classical canon before our eyes. Uh, uh, when you know twenty thirty years ago he was he was really not being played that much except for a few very famous pieces uh, and and not being uh, taken seriously at all in the, in the halls of the academy. Uh, what influences do you see that Shostakovich's music has had on American contemporary composers? Hmm. I think that there are a number of, of uh, younger composers uh, who uh, have um, grown up with his music uh, and uh, paid heed to it in, in significant ways. And I think in a way, I mean, we've seen a uh, partial revival of the symphony as a, as a genre in, in the last 20, 10, 20 years in American music with, uh, uh, with symphonies by uh, John Carl Yano and, and Aaron J. Kernis, uh, William Bolcom uh, here uh, in Michigan, uh, Christopher Rouse, uh, and uh, uh, many of them, though, though, though not all, uh, have have been uh, influenced by Shostakovich. Christopher Rouse, I think, in, in particular, is, is a is a composer. You know, I mean, of course, there's also you know, I mean the great Mahler revival, which uh, crested and, and, and peaked in the in the 1960s and 70s. Actually, continues to there's more and more Mahler performances every day. Um, you know, this this is, has obviously pointed uh, contemporary composers back toward the symphony. But I think especially Shostakovich because. Uh, uh, unlike Mahler, who, who is very much uh, in his own world, uh, Shostakovich is obviously a composer um, in the thick of society. And I think metaphorically, many, many composers now uh, see something of themselves in Shostakovich's struggle. And I think you know, no one uh, you know, deludes themselves that they're, they're facing the same kind of uh, dangers that Shostakovich faced in his lifetime. Um, but, you know, the, the struggle between uh, an audience that continuously demands uh, something simpler and more straightforward from, from composers uh, and then a sort of compositional establishment which has, has a history of, of uh, um, promoting uh, a much more complex vocabulary. I mean, this, this sort of basic back and forth, uh, you know, which really played out in the Soviet Union uh, in much the same way that, that it did in, in, in the West, in European countries in the West, in America, uh, with, with you know, the obvious difference that uh, the, the chief music critic was, was the, the genocidal dictator. Uh, but uh, uh, so his, his pronouncements had, had, a, had a certain force behind them. But uh, you know, de, you know, sort of below that level, uh, it's just, I mean, the composer's union, there's, there's these sort of back and forth in, in the composer's union between the sort of the populists and, 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 the, and the more kind of um, uh, the composers who wanted to write uh, songs for the people and, and, and marches and, and so forth, and then uh, the, the camp that Shostakovich belonged to, the, the, uh, the, uh, the composers with more of a, of a connection with um, European classical tradition, and especially with with 20th century uh, um, European uh, modern music of the uh, of the early 20th century, uh, and 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 sort of, uh, I, I just uh, read some some uh, new material, new speculations uh, on on uh, proposing that uh, the the huge 1948 uproar. Uh, the uh, the Zhdanov decree and then the denunciation of uh, Shostakovich and uh, Prokofiev and the rest uh, really grew more out of a debate within the composers' union, uh, and it was something that uh, that Stalin and Zhdanov and, and, and the higher ups kind of uh, seized on and manipulated and sort of broadcast at the at the the, nat the you know national level. But uh, these composers have been taking pot shots at each other and sort of having this this uh, debate for a number of years. And, and 1948 was just the the moment which it, it sort of exploded and became uh, quite scary when officialdom uh, took one side. 
of the debate. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, just these, 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 if I've strayed very far from your original question, but um, uh, yeah, so Michael Hirsch is another younger American composer. Uh, <laughs> there, there are many, I think, who have, who have felt, you know, the, the sense that you can speak in a, in a language that, that audiences uh, find relatively accessible, uh, and there's something about Shostakovich's music that just people instantly get. Um, and, and yet you, you can have uh, so much complexity, not in terms of just sheer quantity of piling uh, uh, musical patterns on top of each other and uh, maximizing uh, dissonance and, and rhythmic complexity and so forth and so forth, but, but an emotional complexity. Uh, uh, layers of meaning, nuances of mood, shifts of style, uh, uh, manipulating the, the narrative uh, of a work so that, so that you're taken through an, an extraordinary variety of, of, of situations. And, 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 and it's just Shostakovich's music is as complex as it gets uh, on that level, and I feel that very strongly. Um, and uh, I think a, a lot of people have, uh, have come around to that and, and, and realized that complexity uh, can't be measured just in the, the density of notes on the page. 